Our next speaker is a little bit of a hero of mine. Uh, this is Stephen Marsh-Smith. And in the salmon game, you have to play the long game. And uh, Stephen has been involved with the Y and Usk since the mid-90s. And despite the effects of acid rain, uh, habitat uh, degradation, farm uh, pollution and so on, they've batted away regardless and are now seeing the fruits of their labour. So I'll leave it to Stephen then to explain more. How are we doing? Yes? Terrific. Now I'm going to start with a quote I've used many times before. As we have some American visitors here, I'm sure they want to hear the words of their former leader. <laughs> so this afternoon, tell you a bit about us, tell you about the thing we love, the two rivers, and what we did, and what part hatcheries played in the recovery. So, a little tiny bit about us. Don't need to go in great detail there, but we're a registered charity. We're one of a burgeoning population of rivers trusts. We're one of the early ones, um, quite big, relatively speaking, 27 staff. And we work in partnership with uh, typically the NRW and now the, uh, the Environment Agency as they've gone their separate ways uh, across the Y. The one great thing we have, and uh, it's already been touched on, is that we can do something and then market the benefit of it. And unlike wildlife trusts and other biodiversity actions, there really is something in fisheries that makes it special. So, just very briefly then, we've raised quite a lot of money and it's all come from projects, a whole variety of them. And, oh dear, I got point that way. And there's just an approximate list of how we've raised about 13 million quid for the two rivers and a whole variety of different actions. Won't bore you with them now. There we are. Okay. This is where um, we act. The majority of it in Wales, uh, mid Wales and Monmouthshire. Tiny little bit in that other place there. Uh, Herefordshire, a problem in itself. And these are just the figures about these two rivers. Um, it's 155 miles long, I look at it as a Y. Quite a lot of kilometers. I haven't yet made the conversion. And both of them, SACs, which as you already heard, attracts an extra tier of, of management and concern. So the why. Yeah. That just so happens where I live. I live in the upper why. That's my house there. That's the middle why. And again, it has the joy of going back into Wales at Monmouthshire. And that's the why uh, at Wysham. Now, here's an interesting selection of people. Some four creatures, pretty much all of them, destined for what I heard you say, Ken, an extinction vortex. A hereditary peer. <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned gentleman's gentleman. Four sea winter springer, and the tiddler is just a three sea winter at about 20 pounds. Okay, now I've seen some pretty impressive declines on graphs, but beat this. That's <coughs> from where the Y peaked and dropped. I mean, the Greek economy doesn't even look that bad. <laughs> and there are several banks that couldn't even do anything quite so spectacular. <coughs> so there are a lot of questions as to why that happened. And I'm going back now to where it all started. 1973, the Water Act, the setup of the river boards in England and Wales. Now, immediately, they got down to business, and they set up a hatchery. But why? This was absolutely at the peak of anything the Y has ever done historically. Perhaps they knew what was going to happen next. And shortly following on, a very important act for England and Wales, the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Act. It made it an absolute priority to put fish passes on weirs, repair them in such a way that passage, fish passage could take, take place, and a whole load of other protections. And we had no shortage of rearrangements of our statutory bodies to follow. Now, what actually happened? And uh, you guys in NRW and EA might just want to look at your emails and do a bit of texting for a moment.
<laughs> OK. Despite Safa, we managed to lose our biggest tributary, the lug, and with it, the arrow. Uh, we kind of lost control of exploitation. The rather old photo I thought I'd put in. Um, but that's, that was tradition on the upper Y, burning the water. And <coughs> we had fairly poor exploitation. As the thing was dropping, it became more important to conserve fish. We had opportunities to make bylaws. We made it fly only in January, but in June, you could fish with a worm, shrimp, or prawn, and that was our best month. So we managed to put all these things in place without interfering with what was actually inappropriate exploitations. Other problems, acidification. No one knew about this until the early 80s. Sheep dip. Someone invented a wonderful thing called synthetic pyrethroid. It kills everything in the invertebrate world. Not farmers, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and with it came a huge agricultural intensification. We blame the EU just for this one thing. That happened such that in our particular county, the sheep population multiplied four times since 1960. The county, of course, remained roughly the same size. <laughs> But there we are, we had a hatchery to put all this right. And it closed in 94. So, this is, I'll talk about acidification now. About every four or five years, the Forestry Commission produces a document called the Forestry and Water Guidelines. And to celebrate each edition, they do some absolute environmental atrocity. In this case, they promised not to make ditches and trenches across where they were replanting. Well, uh, that's what they did at about the same time. In the back there, there's a fairly recent forest, and that was planted when they discovered the effects of forestry and acid rain. Um, last chance, maybe, they thought, to plant any trees in this part of Wales. And that's the sort of horrible um, dissolved organic carbon mess that ends up in a lot of our tributaries as a result. Now, by 95, we had a few changes. No longer a hatchery. And the head of the uh, Waiparian owners actually did a sensible thing, and that's to go and ask a, a well-known fishery scientist for advice. Um, the advice sort of went something like this. Sort out your barriers to migration. Deal with the physical problem, physical habitat problems. Acid rain, if you can sort it various pollutions and sheep dips, get to grips with abstraction, and get your exploitation rates right. Um, that's one problem we don't have, and I just put it there like that to remind me that the thing's gone away again. Now, what happened was, this learned fishery scientist, and I'm sure Alistair Stephen won't mind me mentioning his name, he said, do all these things, and when you've done them, if it doesn't get better, build a hatchery. Unfortunately, a lot of it got lost in the translation. And it just got to the last little bit, build a hatchery. <laughs> so, 95, we had another one. <coughs> and I'm just going to show you how, with time, the various causes that Alistair mentioned can be attributed to various periods in that terrible graph. So finally, there, the green bit is what you might call productive habitat by area. I love pie charts, they're sort of round and friendly things. The brown bits are where barriers have obscured that proportion of the catchment from migrating salmon. The purple bit, completely damaged by acid rain. And the blue bit, the, the diffuse pollution and farming effects leaving just that tiny little bit, that's all we could find from the electrofishing results, where there was a functioning sort of stream or, or length of habitat. Not doing very well with the click, I'm afraid. Well, there it is. So I'm just going to run through very quickly what we did about each of those particular issues. In the forests, dark, horrible places, 
We, I use that photo because the only place you can actually take a photo is where there's a little gap in the, in the trees there. Otherwise, it's just completely black. But that's the type of drainage system that you need in an area where there's 100 inches of rain every year. And um, we roughly charted, when I say we, I didn't actually do it. Simon, my colleague over there, charted all the potential wet areas that once um, contributed to the source of, of the urban. And as the trees were removed, we started to, that's it, block them up so that we were recreating wetlands in this area of tremendous rainfall and acidity. And yes, there we are. That's what it looked like a year later. I have a very simple test for this. If you lose a Wellington boot, it's working. <laughs> and it really makes a difference. This is the result of some work <coughs> carried out a little further in Mid Wales, comparing block catchment such as that with unblocked. And you can see that the tailing off of flow is much better where we've blocked it off. And you may ask, why 13 days? Well, that's about all you can go for up there before it rains again, so we never found out. <laughs> and as for acidification, we get some really quite spectacular low pHs. Even as recently as last winter, we found a site that dropped to 3.2. And we've been using limestone sand put directly into the first order streams over a whole kind of network to, to improve this. And what am I doing wrong? There's our, our monitoring network on the upper oven. And here is a control and a lime site where you can see just there the application of lime has taken the, one of them well into the range at which salmon can live. Sand liming, very sophisticated process. Um, a little pile like that of irregularly um, ground limestone. There we are. And straight into the stream like that, and so on. So, did this work? And this is the main stem of the urban, right from the source. There we are. And the green bit represents the potential area for salmon production. Below, the pH will be too low. Further up, there's a, se there's a series of falls. So we're talking about a point seven kilometers down from the source. That's as far up as they could reasonably be expected to go. There we are. That was our initial monitoring. And as you can see, didn't really allow um, much base for salmon. But after sand liming, that's one year and a second year, we got that crucial area at least in a tolerable state in respect to pH. Ah, there we are. And that's the urban itself. Can I just go back one there? No. OK, let's try again. That's the main stem. I've lost actually a slide there, but never mind. We'll carry on. That's the improvement of that bit. That's the acidified bit at the top. Oh, sorry, it has missed a slide there. I'm not quite sure where that's gone. But I wanted to show the middle bit there had been really quite a significant improvement as a result of the acidification. On then to the more straightforward sections that have been barred off. So we've got two plans with barriers. And here's the first one. This is the upper Y at Plinlimon. Quite a, a, a decent section. It's, it's the most monitored section of stream in Wales, at least, and probably in England. And it was part of a project to see the effect of forestry as composed to an unforested area. And this was the unforested area. But sometime in the late 70s, or even perhaps later, it suddenly stopped having salmon in it. And this was attributed to just the effects of acidification. 
But what they hadn't appreciated was trout was still there. And if you look at that <coughs> point there, you'll see that there is a stone like that blocking the way. And a couple of blows with a sledgehammer, and there it's gone. And with it, the route back. That's the most cost-effective work we've ever done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Here's another one. Typical old-fashioned weir. Not going to last for very much longer, but with the help of a, <coughs> one of those wonderful machines, quickly restored back to where it was. And another one, lots of these everywhere, hundreds of them, dotted around the various catchments. Poor lad had to stand in the JCB, one of those things that goes like that for about four days until it all went. And here's one the agency did. This is the um, weir at Kenchurch on the Mono. Uh, a similar sort of technique, and it's gone. Thank you, Pete. And we have a plan B. <coughs> plan B is when you can't actually get rid of the obstruction. And a road goes over this, and people use it, so not much we can do. But we discovered a big crack there. <laughs> and you could stick a stick there about 12 feet. It had just washed away. And the whole thing is as a result of strengthening for the sort of modern agricultural vehicles that run up and down the countryside these days. And we did a wonderful deal. The agency, the contractors, and Paris Roads, we literally drew it up on the back of a fag packet. And while they were repairing that there, we put in a very simple means of just getting fish upstream. <coughs> Here's another bridge that's been strengthened. That's about 1.3 meters. And the, an apron there absolutely assures that no fish can get over. And again, a simple double pool like that. The only thing you have to know, that bit has to be wider than that bit there, so it fills up. And fish have used that ever since we put it in. Slightly more difficult are the sort of heritage weirs. And they're a double whammy of disaster. Fish don't like going down them, and they get predated on up here, and they don't like going up them from here. We had something like 100 of them in the Lug and Arrow, so we also had to find something that was affordable. And this is the design that came from Atkins. It's a, um, a diagonal bulk, and the current rolls around there, just allowing a seam of water which a number of species can go up, but particularly salmon. Now, this is the holy water of Cunrig. And this weir um, allows water to be taken off for the, the hatchery. I can't, I can't mention that word. It's terrible. Um, but I understand it has another name, a fish culture unit. <laughs> <coughs> it didn't allow fish to go up itself, so we built this. This was our most ambitious fish pass to date. A lot, a lot of concrete, um, pins, welding, shuttering, and you know all about construction. And we ended up with something like this. The stream comes off the highest mountain in, in the Brecon Beacons, and of course the flow is just incredible when it's going full tilt. And these pools allow salmon to ascend upstream. And this one, which we've already alluded to, the agency came good, and they put a, a decent pass on that side, and again on that side. And that opened up the whole of the lug. Oh, yeah. OK, so just if I can put that into terms that we can all appreciate what we've done. That was the situation in 72. Fair bit of blockage, but not completely. That was 95, this rather sort of seminal year for us. And 
go. Gradually, between us, the agency and ourselves, we got rid of some of the worst barriers. We have this rather aspirational date, 2015, where we think we'll get to there. So the why we've done so far, 62 fish passes, weir removals, opening up that much, and the ask, over 100 kilometers. Now that's the, uh, the urban project that I've already touched on, but I'm going to come back to it in a minute. But let's just show you where it is. And here uh, is the lug and arrow. I'm just going to see if I can show you whether there's been any actual improvement there. This is the electrofishing picture in 2003. Fish passes, 33 of them all together. And that's the position this year. Something of an improvement, I hope you agree. And because we've got the director of the Wild Trout Trust, I'm going to show him what happened to the trout. There we are. The <laughs> Other issues, the habitat. I'm really struggling with this a bit. Is there another? There we are. This, this is, if you like, a sort of entry level <coughs> piece of habitat restoration. An eroding bank, fenced off in July. <coughs> Ten years later, it's narrowed, it's got some cover. You can see the stones in it. And a little bit. More complicated this time, a rather bigger length of eroding bank, fenced off, a bit of tree planting, and a sort of rather more advanced thing with an eroding bend. We've put trees down the bottom. That's after five years, <coughs> seven years, sorry. And that's after nine years. And that's the same year when we've had to go and thin the, thin the alders out. <coughs> Even more advanced is this one, and that's where the pole <coughs> used to be. It was a sort of emergency call from the electricity company to stop that river from taking it out altogether. Again, we pinned trees right down below the water level here and planted a few willow, and that's only three years later. And that's what it looks like from the other side. OK, that's fine. Now, results again. We're trying to show we're making some progress. Back to that urban again. And we did 33 kilometers of habitat restoration, rather as I've shown in that bit. And we divided the results into intensive areas, where we repaired the bank, revetments, and so on. And there were some sections that were Restored, but not intensively, and others within the reach of, uh, of the restoration, and of course, controls. That was the monitoring position in 2010, and you'll appreciate that the intensive sections were, were the most damaged and probably needed the most uh, treatment. Come on, that's it, we've done it. And that's what we got after. Uh, three years of, in terms of increases in fish. Again then, very briefly. <coughs> Herefordshire. And this is the land that invented diffuse pollution. Uh, should run out of battery or what? That's it. Oh, there we are. It's happening. I'm being impatient. We'll go back one then. That's, I have to say, typical for a wet winter in Herefordshire. Maize fields, etc. <coughs> Disasters and abstraction. And I'm not going to blame the water company for this. This is agricultural abstraction. And this is a point above one of their many abstraction points. That's, last, that's this year. Um, not a horrendously dry air, but that is serious abstraction for an SAC. And flooding. 
I have a very funny way of showing you about this. This is a wet spud field. It's soaking wet. And we've got together, or Simon's got together, all the big wigs in spud farming. And he's got a digger there to take a, a chunk out of that field. And there's what he dug out. But the first scoop, and there's the second. <coughs> Absolutely bone dry. But look at this. It's all soaking wet. We have real soil compaction problems. And as a result, flooding everywhere. This is our agricultural project. Two of them, one in Wales, one in England. Oh, Jesus. And just to highlight one small place with one particular issue as a demonstration. This is the curl catchment. And this farm here. Sewage fungus in a rather otherwise pretty healthy stream. And that was treated just by repairing um, a silage clamp, putting a new floor in it. But there are hundreds of farms, and there are thousands of solutions. And we're going over this ground farm by farm to try and put this particular issue right. So in sort of conclusion, I'm using my pie charts again to show where we're going. This is where we want to be with that in terms of habitat recovered for salmon by 2015. Just a little bit of other stuff. We've bought off the estuary nets and putchers. We've established catch and lease only up to there. We needed the agency then to make it legally binding, and we now have 100%. And we're very involved with this. We've done 123 kilometers of getting rid of giant hogweed on the Y and ask. So to finish then, what sort of results do we achieve for our salmon? Well, the Y, you know, is a spring river. And this is the progress from that absolute pit down here, 2002. It's a year sort of sticks in my mind forever. We had a wonderful April this year. Eight salmon over 30 pounds, and 30% 30 over 20. And this is our steady increase in <coughs> five-year rod catch. There we are. So hatcheries, get finished with those. Were they a solution for the Y? We've had four of them. And they have been an almost unremitting source of conflict. Every time there's a drop in catches, the cry goes out, more fish in the hatchery. And it's, what it's done is it's actually stopped people thinking about rivers. They don't go near the, you know, the, when the spawning going on, or they don't, the hatchery people, they don't like to look at what we're doing or appreciate the sort of work that can be done. <coughs> And it is disproportionately expensive. You know, a hatchery that costs 200,000 quid a year, in 15 years, you'll be up to 3 million. The work I've described here was 1.4 million for the two projects. We probably deliver at least 3,000 extra fish for the catchment. And probably, if we're lucky, we'll see 300 from the hatchery. <coughs> It's also prescribed in the site management plan for the SAC. And they, of course, they, this is from my background, they treat the symptoms, but never the problem. And at last, Natural Resources Wales are reviewing the whole issue. So I'm going to be on time, I think, Ken, if I can get this thing to work. There we are. So just to finish with a few slides. This is one of the things we like doing, litter picking, but I love the picture there. And no, it's not going to move. Ah, I'm going to leave you with the wise words of GWB. <laughs> and 
another thing that's good in Wales. Thank you very much indeed.